Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today to visit Claire Kelly in her studio. I love Claire's work. Um, at first glance, it's delightful, it's fanciful, it always makes me feel good. But her work is really much more than feel good. Uh, her sculpture examines the relationship we have with animals and their presence in our environment. Claire integrates complicated glass um, methods, traditional glass blowing and cold working. She works with Kane and Marini with color and pattern. And truthfully, there are not very many artists today who work with these, these techniques. Very few artists, it's, it's very difficult, but the results are amazing. She's very influenced by Venetian masters and by contemporary masters as well. I think particularly Richard Marquis and Tutsinski. And um, uh, Claire actually worked in Tuts' studio for a number of years. And I'm sure that would be interesting to find out what influence that had on, on her career. Um, today, when we go through Claire's studio, she's very happy to answer questions during that period of time. Um, and if you want to ask a question, just um, write it in, or if you hit on the hand, you'll be able to ask the question on your own. Daniel will call on you to ask the questions. But in the meantime, I'd like to introduce you to Claire and let her tell you her story. She's recently moved to Corning, New York, and I'm sure she has lots to tell us. So Claire, thank you very much for being with us today. It's such a pleasure to see you. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you so much. It's so nice to see you, and I'm so thrilled to do this with you today. Um, as Sandra just mentioned, I moved to Corning uh, recently, and when I say moved, we just moved on September 1st. So we're still very much in the uh, settling in phase. I have uh, boxes all over the house, and so when Sandra invited me to do this, um, I said, of course, of course I want to do it, but uh, but it's going to be a little, it's not going to be as finished as, as uh, a normally a studio would be because I'm literally just relocating. Um, I think the way we're going to um, get into things today, I have, um, I have some wonderful work to show you in the studio, but first I want to tell you my story as an artist and a glass blower and, and glass maker. And uh, I think the best way to do that is through PowerPoint. And so we have, a really, we have a nice PowerPoint presentation for you. And then um, a little quick video to watch of some technique. And then we'll head over into my um, garage studio <laughs> that I just set up. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be really nice. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to, to have everybody here today. And so thank you so much for taking your Saturday afternoons to join us. So, yeah. so Dan, Dan will probably start that um, PowerPoint okay. now. There we go. Yep. So um, I think the first slide is just introducing me and we can go back to that first slide. And please let me know that if, uh, when you, if you need me to speak up or you can hear me okay. Um, okay. Just send me a note or just tell me. Okay. Um, so yeah, here I am, Claire Kelly, next. And oh, we missed the Lino one. There was one, wasn't there, with Lino, the first it's, one. It's coming. This is the first oh. slide. Okay, great. We're, we're in good shape. So I went to Alfred University, which is in the southern tier of New York State, very close to Corning. I think not even an hour, just about an hour away. And uh, they have a fabulous glass program there. And so that was my introduction to glass blowing. I also did metal work and neon sculpture while I was there. And so this little piece, I just, it's very dark and hard to see, but it's called uh, Horses Fleeing a Burning Barn. So it has little hot worked horses and this metal barn and these neon flames that were set up on a flickering kind of mechanism. So as you can see, my early work was already quite narrative and um, not exactly humorous, but, but definitely an element of cartooniness to it. Uh, illustration, I would say. Next. After graduating from Alfred, um, I had the good fortune to come directly to Corning, New York to work in the brand new studio, which is the school side of the Corning Museum of Glass. 
And the studio was um, set just having their first sessions and they just needed extra hands on deck to come around and build equipment and sweep up and do all the things that a very new school needs, you know, just uh, assistance. So I was able to spend the entire first summer of the studio at the Corning Museum of Glass being open as an intern and just, you know, watching the artists coming in and out completely unaware of how special an opportunity this was. You know, I was whatever age, 19 or what have you. And um, it was just a whirlwind. And I was just along for the ride. Um, a few years later, I was able to take a class with the maestro, Lino Teglia Petra. And so that's me down there on the left, just looking, you know, completely. You know. No, no <laughs> idea. Yeah, odd is the perfect word. I had no idea what I was seeing or how, you know, how special it was. But, uh, but I, I, you know, I got there eventually. Um, well, at Corning, the first summer, I did meet uh, my future husband, Anthony Schaefermeyer. And we started having a relationship from, from there on. I, I moved out to Seattle for a bit, but we did a long distance thing. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Perfect. And, uh, and with him, I started to work very, very definitely with the Kane and Marini work because he had worked for a glassblower in Vermont who specialized in this kind of work. His name's Robin Mix. Uh -huh. And so there was, yeah. Um, and so there was this really intense learning period where I was kind of helping Anthony um, he had opportunities to travel and so I went to work for Robin and became his assistant and learned these techniques and then together Anthony and I started to really focus in on this one aspect of cane work that was a little bit more like um, geometric mosaics than it was more loose patterning and uh so these are the works that we made together for our first exhibition. Um, this piece was shown at SOFA. And at some point, Sandra, you and I and Anthony started working together and you did yes. represent this work for a while. I did. Yes. I actually, it's not visible, but I have one of your pieces from that era with you and Anthony sitting over yeah. here on my coffee table, which I yeah. should have brought over. Maybe at some oh, point I'll move it over. Great piece. I still love it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, so a lot of this work was, I think it was still pretty new. We were really um, trying techniques and trying um, to access aspects of glass blowing that were very challenging. Mm -hmm. And this work was fraught with, um, with complicated technological challenges. And as a result, we had a lot of failures. And so it was very hard to make. Um, perfection was a huge part of the work um, and, and made the making of it quite stressful. Um, but other than that, I'm, you know, I'm intensely proud of the work we were able to uh, accomplish during our time together. It's very, um, it's very innovative. It's very labor intensive and process driven, but I think the end results are so visually stunning. It, and it is. and there's, no, there's no other work that I know that looks like it, mm -hmm. um, it you know, to, to some degree. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what the pieces would look like laid out on a ceramic kiln shelf before being blown. And this is all these, uh, I'll show, show you later how the cane is made, but these are all canes that are then cut into the individual tiles and little tiny triangles that you see there. Next. And then that's what the finished Beautiful. piece. Was. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. these are stunning pieces. They're, they're really special. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very proud of, of what we did together. Uh, things did change though. My life um, changed a bit. And in 2008, next. I think you all remember the year 2008. Um, <laughs> it was a yes. rough year. I mean, it has nothing it on was. 2020, but back back then, 20, 2008 was really difficult. Um, everybody's everybody's sales um, were just tanking. All the galleries and shops were just completely. You know, there was just the economy was awful. 
people were becoming unemployed, losing their homes. It was, it was a mess. That's and it's, and in that year, um, Anthony and I did decide to dissolve our relationship, both professionally and romantically. So, you know, that was a huge, big change for me. And because of us being emotionally involved and also professionally involved, I really didn't want to make glass at that time. I mean, for all the reasons, for the, the economy, for the, just the, the, the mental energy that it took, I, I really just wanted to be, I think, in a way, taken care of. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And that led me to reach out to a friend uh, that I knew through mutual friends in Amsterdam, and that's uh, Tutsinski, the very uh, well-known and very uh, okay. influential and talented glassmaker. So I had known Toots, like I said, through mutual friends. Toots was based in Amsterdam with her studio for years. And I had friends in Amsterdam and was able to get to know Toots a little bit through them. And um, I always show this picture because we found it. It's a pamphlet. It, it was in Toots' studio. And it's the 69th Conference on Glass Problems. And I just love that. I was like, when, when are these conferences I need to attend? <laughs> I, I have all kinds of glass problems. Um, and it's, it sounds like maybe there's a support group involved, you know. <laughs> we, can, we can all get together and lament our glass problem. So um, we can go to the next slide. So in uh, late 2008, Toots took me on as an assistant, which was fabulous. So I moved to Providence, Rhode Island to work with her that was uh it was you know it was a huge change for me i was suddenly going from being an you know self-employed artist who was fully you know making their own work to working for one of the best known glass artists in, in arguably the world and learning her technique and really just sort of living under her umbrella of influence um i worked for toots for 10 years and during that time I can't understate her, yeah, um, her influence on me as an artist. Although I've always been a glass blower, I learned a lot working with Toots just in terms of being open to your creativity and not always just putting it into one, one place and really living and thinking and being as an artist. And I learned lots from her about you know, photography, how to document your work, um, all these things, packing and shipping, lots of different aspects of living your life as an artist just really gelled for me under her influence. And this photograph is actually, Toots was invited to go to, um, sorry, to come to Corning. You'll, you'll hear the word Corning a lot over the course of this presentation. Um, as a visiting artist at Sullivan Park, which is the research and development um, arm of Corning Incorporated. And so she was invited to come under the auspices of Corning Incorporated, not just the museum, which was, was also involved. And I was able to come as her assistant. And, um, oh, is anybody else getting uh, some? There's, a, uh, there's just a blank. Oh, little there we go. There it goes. Um, so it was just fabulous. I was able to join her on so many adventures. Uh, she took me to England with her. She took me to Germany with her. She took me to Venice with her. It was, I mean, I just, I think I just really needed the time to kind of chrysalis myself with this new influence and in this new world so that I could emerge on the other side of it as a different kind of artist. Uh, we can we can go to the next slide. And I started doing a little bit more drawing during that time. I didn't really have access to a glass studio. And so I was, you know, just doodling, doodling in my sketchbooks and, and messing around or, you know, while I was watching the Tootsie's thread pulling machines, I might just have like a pencil and pen and just making these little, these little drawings. And, um, I kept drawing the same shape over and over again, and it was this funny little elephant shape. And I kind of just started to get into that a bit. And I decided, okay, I really, I really need to see this realized in glass. I need to figure out at some point how to make this. Uh, next. And so I started the process of 
figuring out how to make this little elephant. And this is the first one. I had an opportunity to make a piece for a, um, the glass blowing school in New Orleans and they were doing an auction and I had lived in New Orleans for a while. And so I wanted to support them. And they said, would you, you know, would you mind donating a piece? And I was like, Oh, perfect opportunity. This is, I'll make this little elephant and figure it out and put it on a piece of blown glass and that'll be for the auction. And so this is the first elephant. He's so sweet and funny. He's like little funny ears and he doesn't have a tail. Like the tail <laughs> came later, but, um, you know, cause I just wasn't there yet, but uh, I just love him so much. Like it's, they'll never look like that again. Cause I, I can't, once you, once you learn how to do something, it's like child's drawings. Once you get good at something, you can't go back to the sort of wonky clumsiness of it when it, when you first started doing things. And uh, we can we can go to the next slide. And I started to refine them and really figure out what I wanted them to look like. So now you can see that some cane has started to enter the picture, that uh, the, the elephant has a little tail. The form has gotten much more, you know, not, not exactly um, in any way realistic, but more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And so that was, this started to take me down the road uh, towards, towards the, the work that I would eventually really start to make. And I would say this is an approximately 2014, um, maybe going into 2015. Next. And just to talk about glass elephants for a moment, um, I'm very fortunate to be in this little collection in Massachusetts that has on the left, that's a uh, Richard Marcus piece. Mm. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't tell you the year but he's a contemporary artist and so he's working in Venetian techniques he's you know extremely well known but uh, obviously he's a huge influence on me I love his uh, I love his dedication to um, like these techniques but then also his irreverence for making things very perfect or very um, just sleek and shiny he's he's really he's really great at at letting gesturality take over and then the piece above is uh, on the on the right top, the black elephant. That's um that's a uh, Napoleone Martinuzzi. He was the glass maestro for Vanini and did a lot of the animals and plants that were very well known in the, um, the early mid century and kind of stand apart as these pinnacles of mid century glass making. And then we have my contribution on the bottom right to this uh, to this I guess. Uh, T tradition of you know elephants being a, so a sweet. <laughs> yeah you know they're they're visual um collectibles i suppose you know they they definitely fit into that collectible um category and in addition we can uh next in addition i i had never had an elephant collection but per se, I don't have a lot of big collections of anything, but this was my wallpaper when I was a, uh, a young child. And uh, I credit this to my mother. She, she picked it out and she installed it. And uh, I mean, just look at how wild it, I mean, there was, there was a wall that had that on it that was, that was above the bed. So repeating pattern. So I was very fortunate to be able to salvage one piece of it that was left over after the bedroom was remade when I was you know, a teenager. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's just so funky. I just love it. Like, you know, so 70s. Um, so I think we can say that it had an influence on me. And then um, just elephants in general in, in, the, uh, in the real life world um, are such a symbol of benevolence and peace. And they are a matriarchy as, as a herd. And they're just these wonderful and unique animals. And um, and then you have to take the other side of that, which is that they're, you know, perilously threatened uh, as a species. And unfortunately, that is almost 100% due to human intervention. I mean, it's really humans who are causing that decline. And um, that's the kind of thing that um, it's, it's hard to be a person in the world these days. We have all this responsibility and really no way to directly influence it. You know, the tiny decisions that we make seem like they're loaded with, with meaning and 
is it the right decision? Is it not? Should I eat organic? Should I eat local? Should I, you know, it's everything is so unknown of the repercussions that it has down the line and down the line and down the line. And, uh, and I think that after a lot of time, just thinking about all these impossible decisions that we try to make, I think that making this work was a way of therapy, you know, be, being in therapy for me. It was a way of putting my emotions into a new place and saying, yes, we live in this complicated world, but here I'm going to make this small world that's very safe. We can go to the next slide. And just making them very happy and beautiful and putting these animals in a position that just says, I'm in my own little world and this, this little microcosm is, is protected and it's beautiful and it, you know, it feels good here. And so this new, this new series of work is very much about me taking these interior, this interior conflict and putting it in, back outside me and into glass. Um, I don't only make elephants. I have some other fun ideas that I play with. We can go to the next slide. So I made these sea serpents right around the same period when I was starting the, the elephants and they were kind of a, an exercise in assemblage and also just based on these funny drawings that I had done. Um, the one on the right is actually supposed to look like a teapot. So I was uh, approached to be part of a teapot show and so this was my contribution to that and you know I just I love those. I think they're really fun. So we can go to the next slide. These are the the canes. These are the raw materials that I make to create most of the mosaic patterning that you see and some of the other patterns as well. Um, the, the word cane comes from a sort of Italian word, cane, but if you talk to Italians, they'll tell you like, no, oh, that's not really what it means. It's it's one of those things. We just, we just use the word cane um, for lack of any better word for it. Um, and this is very much what I learned working for Robin Mix in Vermont. This is the technique that I learned and that I learned how to make for him as an assistant. And so I continued to take this technique and create all these colored glass rods that will then be chopped up and made into something later. So the next slide will show you um, some of those colored rods that have been cut on a, on a little uh, diamond saw. So they're cut at an angle, reassembled onto a ceramic plate. And then the next slide will show you the finished piece. And so that has the, the mosaic that was blown in the glass studio. And then the, the elephant is made separately and adhered onto the glass with a very um, high-end museum quality adhesive. Uh, the next two slides show the same kind of process. So we see the mosaic pattern and then the final piece. So that's what I get up to in my day-to-day -day artist practice, uh, figuring out what, um, what I need to make, what colors they're going to be, getting the forms ready. Um, I, some days I'll spend the whole day just making elephants. Some days I'll spend the whole day just pulling cane. And then some days I get the big team together and we do the mosaic roll-ups. Um, on top of the elephant and mosaic pieces, I also have some other work that I make that's um, more loose. We can go to the next slide. A little bit more loose, just line work or these loopy kind of, um, the, the piece on the right uh, became a part of a series that I, that I do now called Circumstellar, where, the, uh, where the, the pattern loops, but in, instead of looping downward, like you see in this piece, the, uh, the pattern actually loops upward like a rainbow. And you'll see some more of those as we go forward. And the piece on the left, it was my first foray into making um, giraffes. So it's kind of sticking with the African animals a little bit. Um, you can see the little tail on there. Those tails are string, they're not glass. Um, I know the material well enough to know that if I made the tails out of glass, they would be the absolute first thing to get broken. <laughs> and I'd constantly be having people getting in touch with me and saying, oh, the tail broke off. So I don't want to be too much of a material chauvinist, so I make the tails out of string. 
But if anyone wanted a glass tail, I could certainly do that. Uh, next. And then we have here on the left, a little sea lion with a ball perched on its nose. And that's on that circumstellar patterning that I was talking about. So these really loopy stripes that go up like a rainbow rather than looping downward like a necklace. And the ball on the seal's nose, these are so cute. I would, I really need to make more sea lions. Um, I haven't had a chance to recently, um, but the ball on the nose has little marinis on it that are, that are little hearts. So I love to play with the little funny patterns like that. It's, it's so much fun. And the piece on the right, um, I, I really love this, this color combination. They're so special. Pinks and glass are very fussy colors to work with. Um, but I love this color combination and I love the, the giraffe. For every one good giraffe that I get, there's probably two or three that I don't, that I don't feel are successful. They're really challenging to make. Um, so it's, it's been something I've been sort of struggling with. And it doesn't help that I didn't have constant access to a glass blowing studio. I was very often taking months in between sessions in the glass blowing studio to do cold working and things at the at home and then getting into the glass blowing studio and suddenly being like, oh, I have to remember how to blow glass again. Mm -hmm. So some of that changed. So in the next slide, we're gonna, um, we're gonna shift a little bit and go to 2017. I wrote a proposal to the Corning, to the studio at Corning to be a re to do an artist in residence residency here at Corning. And my goal for that was to try a different glass. So the piece on the left is a, uh, it's a circumstellar piece that I made. And in fact, um, it, um, I got it home from the, you know, we took it out of the annealer at the studio where I made it. I took it home and I was doing some work. I was cold working and doing some stuff and I heard it break behind me. It just popped and it made a noise and I turned and I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I was shocked. It was depressing. It's so sad, you know, all that time, all that work, you know, I had had to, you know, get a team of glass blowers together to help me make this and just to have it all just be gone in a second was, uh, it was rough. And I wish I could say this was the only piece that ever happened to, it, it, it is not. Uh, glass colors are their own very, very special science and uh, they, they're unpredictable. So I knew because I had worked and had at that time still was working for Toots, that there was a different kind of glass available and it was um, a different coefficient of expansion than what we normally use in, in just a general glass blowing studio anywhere in the US. And it was called uh, Effetre glass or Moretti glass. And it's made in Italy. And it was formulated to melt at a slightly lower temperature. And as a result, the colors stay brighter and more true because they don't have to reach such high temperatures to get hot. Um, but not very many people use it except for maybe lamp working, um, uh, you know, working on the torch because the furnace glasses don't fit with these colors. So most of the furnace glasses that we use at any, any given studio, including at Corning, if you mixed that glass with these colors, I'm, in this case, I'm talking about this photograph on the right, these bundles of glass, um, anything you made would break. So I applied to Corning and I was like, I know that there are these glass colors. Toots uses them in her work. I want to use them in the glass blowing studio. And here's, here's why and here's how. And so I applied for the residency and I got it. And so the, the reason Corning was the perfect place to hold this residency is because they were able to take um, their color furnaces, which are two furnaces with smaller uh, interior chambers, maybe uh, maybe 120 pounds a piece, as opposed to like 400 pounds, which is what the big furnaces hold. And we got the clear crystal glass from Italy, as well as the colored glasses that you see in that photo. We imported everything from Italy and we melted the clear crystal glass in those furnaces so that I had a pot of clear glass to use. And then I could add 
these special colors to that to make my work. Uh, we can go to the next slide. This is a picture of the factory in Italy, uh, Effetre, that makes these colored glasses. And these were photographs that I took when I was able to visit that factory with Toots in, um, on Murano. And then also again later for the Glass Art Society's conference in Murano uh, a few years later. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And this is some of the work that I began to make out of that colored uh, effetre or one of four glass. So it took me a while to learn the to learn the techniques. The format that the color came in was different than I was used to working with. So I had to reconfigure my approach to how I was making my canes and how I was making my patterns. But once I got that down, once I figured out how to handle the colored glasses and how to to uh, troubleshoot any of the issues I was having, it really started to come together. It's a fabulous glass to work with. It's very brilliant and beautiful. And the colors are just so saturated and gorgeous. So I was, I was hooked. I was like, this is, this is the stuff. I love this. And um, so this is some of the work. I had a month at the residency and this is some of the work that I made. So I had the first two weeks to really figure out how to use everything and how to troubleshoot. And then I took the second two weeks to make finished work. And then this next slide is kind of the showpiece that I have from that residency, which really showcases um, not necessarily as much unique mosaic work or um, patterned work that my, may, maybe my work is more known for, but it really showcases how I learned to control and work with these colors. Because when you work with raw color, even when you case it with clear, clear glass, there's always a lot going on that you, under the surface that, that you're not seeing. There's a lot of push and pull, different colors move at different temperatures. And there's a lot of uh, chemical reaction that goes on. If you put certain colors next to each other, the compounds inside the color react. And there's a lot of mucking around that I can do to control that, but it's all things that are totally under the surface. You know, it's that, it's that duck, that duck feet under the surface. Everything looks calm. Um, you know, when you just see the duck on the, on the water, but his, but his feet are going furiously underneath. And so this was my little showpiece that, that came out of that residency. And eventually I sent these pieces off piecemeal to different galleries. And for the most part, they've, been all sold. There's one or two still out there, um, but they're few and far between these days. As a direct result of the residency at Corning, I created a, pres a presentation proposal for the Glass Art Society, which was going to be taking place in Venice uh, the following year. And my proposal was accepted. And we can go to the next slide. And so I was invited and accepted to be um, a vis one of the demonstrating artists at the Glass Art Society in Venice at the Effetre studio. So I'm actually working at the studio where this colored glass was made. And it was really, I mean, it was a joyous, fun occasion. I was, I was so lucky. Um, I was very honored, of course, because, you know, to have Americans working in Venice, the, sort of like the, the mother the motherland, it was... Uh, you know, it's just really touching to, to be able to do that. They, um, they set up a little glass blowing studio in uh, the factory at Effetre, and I brought with me some pre-made Marinis that I had made during the Corning residency. And then I went into their back room with one of the owners and was able to pick out my colors. And it was really fun because I don't speak Italian, and his, his English was quite good, but I speak zero Italian but I know all the names of all the colors in Italian because I was working for Toots before this and we always referred to the colors by their Italian names. And then of course I was working with them in my own capacity and just had everything memorized. So I was able to go in and say precisely which colors I wanted in Italian. I felt very, I felt very accomplished. <laughs> so um, at the same time during that conference, we can go to the next slide. I reconnected with Ms. Sandra Ainsley, 
uh, because I was working for Toots for so long and not really making a lot of work, um, I, I wasn't approaching galleries very much, but Sandra and I ended up being on the, um, on the Vaporetto together a few times and running into each other. And we had some nice, nice little catch ups. And she made it very clear that as soon as I felt like my work was ready, that she wanted to start to represent it again. And I said, of course, I can't wait. I'm, I'm honored. And, you know, you know, I just, I want to make sure that I feel like the work is, is appropriate to show in such a prestigious gallery. And so I was continuing, continuing to work and continuing to make my pieces. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Because I wasn't able to be in the glass blowing studio all the time, I started to lamp work a little bit and teach myself some lamp working. So these are just some little examples of very simple um, creatures, little little birds and their little nests with eggs in it that I that I could just do on the side in my studio when I wasn't in the glass blowing studio. Just really, we're going to take a, just a quick side trip before we get back to the glass, um, glass my glass work that is uh, next. I took a class on Murano with Davide Fuin. He's a goblet master and he is arguably the finest um, goblet slash cup maker in the world and possibly one of the few that's left uh, working in traditions that maybe aren't being passed down through generations anymore because of the market changing dramatically and styles and kind of things, uh, just things changing. So that was a real honor. I was in the class with him on Murano. We stayed on the island. It was wonderful. We got to feel like locals. It was just such a, such a pleasure. And uh, I was not a star student. It was very, very hard work and I, I struggled. It was really difficult. This little piece on the right was the final thing that I made the last day of class. It was, you know, my kind of difficult attempt at a goblet, but then I, I wrapped a little cane snake around the, around the stem and gave it a little face. So that was kind of my little, my little uh, addition to, uh, I don't know, I guess my take on a, a, a serpent goblet. Uh, next. And when I'm not blowing glass, I, do try to continue to draw. So these were just some funny little cartoons that I did for a friend whose house I stayed at and when I taught in Seattle and they had these adorable dog and cat. So I did some little caricatures of them. Um, next. And these are drawings I did during COVID uh, because we had so much time at home. I shouldn't say during COVID, of course it's still happening. Um, but during the real heart of quarantine, when we were trying not to leave the house for, for days. So I would just uh, sit down and draw the, draw the pets as they just did their, their stuff around the house. Next. And I continue to draw my ideas. It's all very illustrative. Um, I... Uh, I just try to get all these ideas down on paper. I mean, drawing is very inexpensive. It's, it's a good way to, to get ideas down. And then I can refer back to them when I'm thinking about what I want to do when I'm in the glass studio. I can, I can use these drawings as a, as a place to jump off from. And the drawing on the left, there's a, there's a kind of tall, funny cone-shaped piece sort of just off center with two little uh, foxy looking animals on it. Mm -hmm. And that directly influenced the next slide, which was one of the pieces from the Corning residency with this new fox form that I was starting to work on in the glass blowing studio. And so you can see where the, the drawing directly contributed to the idea coming to fruition in glass. And another thing I did during quarantine was I started to to do beading. We can go to the next slide. And so I bought uh, a big selection of colored seed beads from a jewelry supply um, place in, in uh, Rhode Island and I learned how to do peyote stitch. And so this is just a, it's a, a wool core. So the, the core is made of wool and then I stitched the beads around it and really just let the pattern take over. I, I just as, as I went, I would just add colors and then like just kind of let it do its own thing. It was really 
Yeah. Very med- Yeah, very meditative. Now I get why people knit. Mm. <laughs> I've never, I was never a knitter. Mm-hmm. This helped me. This really helped me get uh, into into that mind frame. So, ne- the next slide is just really quickly to show you some of the places that I've lived. Uh, top left is the house I lived at in New Orleans. From there, uh, I moved to the Spruce Pine area where I did a three-year residency. So that was the lake behind the house where I lived in Spruce, in Spruce Pine, North Carolina, right down the road from Penland School of Crafts. On the bottom left is the building that Anthony and I bought in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which subsequently he he's, um, still has. And the blue house down here on the right is, uh, is that's our house in Corning. So we can go next to the next, you know, isn't it? It's so cute. Mm -hmm. And and so now I'm in Corning. So this move has been on my mind for years. Um, I was always coming to Corning to make a lot of work anyway. It was just the one studio that I knew I could come to and really be productive, have very talented assistants. And when I got here, I could just concentrate on making glass. And it would just, it was always just a place of, a production and joy and everything just always felt good when I was here. And I'm, you know, not anything against Providence. I loved living there, but I didn't really have good access to glass blowing there. The, the nearest studios were pretty far away and I would have to schlep all my stuff with me every single time I went. And it just felt very, like very hard work. And when I went to Corning, everything was just there in one little town. So, um, so that's me on the picture with my team. Uh, these, are, these are two assistants I love to work with. The, the fellow on the right is Darren Dennison. He also lives in Corning and he's one of Lino's team. So when he's not with Lino, he's here. Uh, he teaches at the studio. Um, he, he, moved, he moved here with his wife and they're, they're doing all kinds of fun, fun projects. And the young woman on the left was my friend Rachel who uh, went to grad school at RIT. And then down below, I just love this little uh, beaker with the cor- with some of the Corelware um, patterning on it. I just think that's the, the funniest little crossover of like decorative and scientific glassware. So the next slide, these are some pieces that I conceived of through my drawings and then was able to realize in the glass blowing studio. And these are very much based on um, sort of literary narrative. Um, they're, they're definitely little stories of moral and maybe even amoral behavior um, because everything in the natural world is so subjective. You know, there are no good guys and there are no bad guys. Nature is a tough cookie. And so, you know, we see things, they're sort of like, oh, it's so cute, it's this, it's that. Um, but really things are happening out there in, in, the, in the world that you, you, we want to root for, for somebody. And, you know, in this one case, maybe you're like, I'm going to root for the fox. But then you see this little bird and the bird's nest in the trees. And it's like, oh, you know, the fox is probably going to try to kill those. <laughs> um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of um, uncertainty in the world. And so the, the name of the series is Parallax to connote a you know, how things, things change depending on what per- perception or what angle you see them from. And I think it's really important for us as humans to remember that, that we're not the only point of view that matters, that we have to take into consideration every point of view, whether we like it or not, um, or whether it resonates with us or not, because they're all equally valid. You know, the smallest thing has every much, has, has as much a uh, will to, to live and, and a right to be as, as the, you know, us, the biggest things in, in you know, in the world, um, except ticks. Ticks are without redemption. That's true. <laughs> Maybe mis- mis- Are you, you in know, tick country? Uh, I mean, what isn't these days? Mm-hmm. So this piece is on display at Sandra Ainsley Gallery. It's called, uh, this is called Parallax Allegory. And it's a fabulous piece. It's set up to be on display as a large um, installation, but the pieces are available individually. 
Then the next slide, this is some very current work uh, created in 2020. And I think I, I just was able to deliver this to you, Sandra, with, within the last few months. That's right. And so, yeah, so this is some more current work, this very large mosaic piece on the right with sort of a, a tied in elephant. I don't always make them match a lot, but for some reason these, these pieces, uh, I don't know, just kind of the, the, the way the elephant seemed to kind of grow out of its environment sort of worked for me. And this piece on the left is the, um, the fox form on top of one of my pieces from the Corning residency actually that I remade, or I didn't remake it, I, I repurposed it. Mm -hmm. It originally had a different form and I, I changed it up a little bit. I like to do that. I have access to a cold shop, so sometimes I end up cutting things up. Uh, we can go to, and these two pieces are on, on view at uh, Sandra's gallery. And as, these pieces as well, these are, all, these are both from 2020. Um, this beautiful mosaic that I was able to make with the um, really just charming elephant on top. That is not available, Sandra. That is no, I was just about to say, I think we sold that piece. You did. Um, and the piece next to it, which has a really complicated pattern, um, this sort of, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like large wheels made out of, um, or almost like a snowflake mm -hmm. pixelated pattern made out of the, uh, the different cut up canes. And this, this uh, you know, again, sort of mat, this elephant made out of the same color combination of, of canes on top. So very, um, yeah, very, they're just, I just love, I just love the way that the patterns speak about the piece. I love the way that they move over the course of the blown glass, the, um, where the elephant's legs pull down. That's very important to me that that continues that pull of the glass. So you really see the gesturality of it all and the process that went into making them. And I think the next slide is me just, I was doing a little funny uh, demonstration at the Corning Museum of Glass um, road, hot, hot Glass Road Show. I think in, uh, this is on Nantucket. And I guess what I wanna end with as far as this PowerPoint presentation goes is, and we can go to the last slide, is that my main focus with this new work is to love it and to have it be fun. And so that when I'm making it, I want that to come through for my audience that, that yes, we have a lot to think about and yes, there's a lot to worry about and yes, we have a lot of stress, but we always have to maintain like hope and laughter and to not always take things too seriously. So thank well you. Said. <laughs> thank Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, you didn't, you didn't work. That was perfect. And so that's, my story, I've, I feel like I went a little bit longer than I meant to, so I apologize for that, guys. Um, if you want, we could watch the uh, cane pulling video. Yeah. And then while that's happening, I'll head over into my studio and then meet you guys over there. Okay, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Of course, thank you guys. And I can talk a little bit while we're doing this. I think you'll be able to hear me. We have to wear masks in the studio. So my assistant is bringing me. Oh, a lot of that noise, doesn't it? So that was me picking up the cane. So I've got a glob of clear glass and I've just picked up some colored stripes just on the side there. and I'm working them in on the metal table. So 
this is just me heating in the glory hole that those colored stripes are going to start to get hot and adhere to the surface of that clear glass that I picked them up on. And I'll continue to do that a few times to make the shape just right. So I'm just rolling back and forth. And then in a minute here, I'm going to pull, yeah, I'm going to cut in with the tools at the bench, a little knob at the bottom of the glass. And that's going to give me something to grab onto later. So I'm kind of angling up the glass so that I can point up the end a little bit. And then I go to the bench and use, that, by the way, this is the Corning Studio. So this is at the, the studio at the Corning Museum of Glass. And this is where I'll be making all my hot work. Everything, I'll just have access to the studio to be able to make my work. And that makes it so that I don't have to have my own cold, uh, my own glass blowing studio. Because I don't need to blow glass every single day, all day. I don't, my work takes uh, a lot longer to make than that. So it would be the patterns that where you invest most of your time then. Is that right? Claire? Yeah, so yeah, so much of the work that I make is is involved in um, cutting in the in the cold shop. Mm -hmm. So if I have to sit down and cut up all the cane, I'll usually set up the diamond saw and, and cut for hours and then you know, listen to books on tape, listen to podcasts. So right now, if you look, you can see the glass. I'm not turning anymore. I'm kind of like stopping on the glass table and letting it flatten on two sides. So this is starting to make that rectangular shape that I was talking about. And then that little knob I made it make at the bottom, I'm gonna keep that cold by dipping it in water. And so I think I'll use the metal table one more time. And the studio is so wonderful. They're really great at um, keeping me, um, it, you know, they're, they're, whatever tool you need, they've got it. And I'll say, you know, oh, I need this today. No, no problem. So they, are you they the- spoil, They spoil me rotten. <laughs> Do you work in the studio on your own or is there someone else using the studio at the other end or at the same time? There, there can be other artists working at the same time as me. Because of COVID, we can only have two benches in this larger studio open at a time. Okay. During regular years, you might have three benches open. Mm -hmm. Um, but with COVID, they have uh, they have restrictions for the number of people that can be in the studio at a time. And of course, we're all wearing masks. And they have uh, a tube system set up so that you can blow glass by putting a tube on the end of the pipe and then um, stepping on a foot pedal, and that will inflate the glass. In this really? case, we're not blowing glass. This is all solid while I make the cane. So I'm letting it fall. Then we hook it into this little system, and my assistant brings it up for me and I grab that knob and pull. And so this gives me a lot of control because I can access almost all parts of the glass. So I'm using a little compressed air there to just cool a little, a little section. And then I pull and I might tell the assistant, go ahead and lift. Yep, she's, she's raising it up. And I grab it with these, these little scissor tools and pull on the knob. And I'm very specific about how thick and wide it is. So I'm using that compressed air to keep it, to keep it cool in just a few little spots. And then I'll just give it a nice little pull and keep it nice and straight. Um, so this is not a very, this is not a very long cane pull. We can do them all the way up to the ceiling. So can I ask you a question? Is Please. this a technique that's uh, traditional to you? Like I noticed your cane is flat and yep. usually cane or often it isn't, it's round or... Yeah. So, that's, so why, yeah. tell us about that. Why is your cane different? Why do you pull it differently? So in this case, I want it to be flat because I want to be able to make those um, patterns out of it. And if they were round, it would be really hard to cut them geometrically. 
If you take a, if you take a, and oh, it, here's me taking the cane down. So we're just, we're just snapping it into sections. And then I grab it with the hot gloves. We don't, there we go. <laughs> grab the last one. And then I'll put those in the annealer. And those will, those will anneal overnight. So pulling, pulling it vertically gives me the opportunity to control. Oh, and there's, there's a good shot of the, the annealer filled with our cane. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's, it for the, uh, that's it for the video. I'm going to take us into the studio now. And actually, I'm going to grab my assistant really quickly. Okay. Hey, Cyril, you want to come down now? Sure. I'll meet you in the garage. My little garage studio. So um, here we go. I'm just going to let myself out the door. So yeah, the round cane wouldn't really give me an opportunity to slice them on the diamond saw okay. the way that I think would work best. So we're entering, I'm going to turn the camera around now so we can see the studio. So this is my, this is my garage, part of the house that I'm living in. And so I'm able to bring you guys into my little world. I'm going to make this bigger for myself so that I can, oh, actually that's fine. So these are some pieces that I was able to make since I got to Corning back in September. Some nice new work. This is part of a series called the Lifeboat series with these little animals in boats, referencing Noah's Ark, of course. And so these are really the fabulous mosaic patterns. Beautiful. Some really new forms. You know, just still, still trying to get a little bit braver with the forms, but it's yeah. always it's always tough when you're in the glass blowing studio. So sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So here's, like our, that. here's our little hello birds. Baby. Yeah, protecting its nest, and here's the the wily fox. You know, will he get it? We don't know. And this, this uh, tree form is very special. This is, uh, these were marinis that I made and I was finally able to make a piece out of, but the colors are just so beautiful. They're very, they look like they'd burn you if you touched them. They're so bright and hot. And then this final mosaic piece, which I think is just a real stunner. And this very cool, very beautiful simple. pattern. Very yeah. nice. Uh, it's simple, but sometimes, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. simple is the best. You have to love those so, ears. Those ears yeah, are great. Our truce ears. Yes. So as you can see, the, you know, the color is really, really important to me. I love to play with color. I love um, what glass is capable of with colors. And, uh, and, you know, just playing with the way that they react together, the way that they speak to each other. It's very, it's very special, especially like this orange, this, this fox. It's like, it's really hard to find that orange. It's really, it's very special. And here's that piece that Daniel opened us with. This is part of the Circumstellar series. Mm -hmm. so the, uh, the elephant in this case is made up of many, many little lines. And it's blue, it's blue and green together. It might look black here, but it's not. It's like mm -hmm. a really, it's like a lapis blue. I don't know if you can see that. And then this one's also very special. I love pink and orange together. Mm -hmm. So here's this pink and orange circumstellar pattern with the elephant on the top. And the elephant has these gorgeous uh, salmon colored ears and the salmon of the ears really brings out the orange in the in the base piece. So I'm going to hand off this uh, iPad to Cyril so that he can film me um, in in full view. But really quickly, I'm going to show you. Here's some of the supplies that I have in my studio. So there are the beads. So I did these beading projects, like I was talking about during quarantine. Just, oh, so they're so satisfying. I, I haven't figured out how they're going to fit into my work yet, but it's, it's on my mind. I, I'm hoping it's something that is going to come around. And here are some of the raw materials. So, Sandra, here's exactly what you're talking about with round cane. Yes. Right? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, I'm sorry if I went a little long. I feel... I no, you didn't. Bad. It was so interesting. Well, it just, it's, a, it's a lot to talk about, I guess. So it would just be really hard to take this and make it into um, a pattern, you know, because you're working with this... Um, yeah, there's no way that it can yeah, you, you do I'm, that. I'm flat. trying to think of the right word. The shape, right. the shape is not the shape is mm -hmm. not right. So I do make a lot of cane, and especially we're talking about round cane. Like here's a whole bunch, mm -hmm. and I'll use this to then make either. Um, in this case, it'll probably become the elephants. Okay. Because I'm because I do use um, these little pre-made cups to make the elephants with. So I make I make this in the glass blowing studio, and I make a long tube. And then I cut the tube into sections. And so each section will become an individual animal. And here's an example of that with the foxes. This is a, this is a fox tube. So you can see it's got cane all around it. Three quarters is orange and maybe a quarter or a third is this beautiful beige color. And so this is a future fox. Mm -hmm. And what and, made you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. I'm just showing no, no, you guys. These are, these are some of the raw setups. So these are canes that I've cut up to make some of the circumstellar pieces. And they already have the, uh, the color embedded into the glass. And so that's what will give those, those really nice patterns. And here's a bunch more raw materials on this table over here. So this is all that cane that I was following, like you saw in the video. And some of this will get used to make simpler patterns. Some of it will get used to make more complicated patterns like the mosaics that you saw. All right, you want to grab that? The horizontal? Uh, yeah. No, no, this way, vertical. Okay. Thanks. Because they want it to be this way. Hi. Ah, oh, there you are. Right. Hello. Uh, we, so, we see all of you. Yeah. So. so this might be a good time for me to take questions. Sure, wonderful. Daniel, do you have some questions there? Yes, so if you have a question for Claire, you can, use, you can either type it in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen or tap on the hand on the bottom and you can ask Claire your question directly. So Claire, I have a couple of questions that have already come in for you. Okay. Um, first question, Judy would like to know, do you have, do you live with animals? Do you have animals yourself? Yes. Uh, so my uh, very good friend, Cyril, who's holding the, the camera for us right now and has moved to Corning with me. He's, he's a transplant to Corning. He's, uh, he's got, he had three cats when we moved in together and I had a cat and a dog. Uh, one of the cats has since passed away. So we're down to three cats and one dog. And that's, that's the extent of our menagerie right now. No, no exotic pets or farm animals at this no time. El no <laughs> elephants. <laughs> only, only, only glass elephants. And I actually, you know, I actually had a client uh, one time tell me, a collector, who said that when she's at her house, she talks to, uh, to her <laughs> elephant. To her elephant. <laughs> I just I love that. I think that's the sweetest thing. She just, like, chats with it. Okay. Linda would like to know, when you were in New Orleans, did you work with uh, Jean Koss? Oh, I knew Jean only professionally. He was at Tulane. Uh, so no, Jean, I never had any work time with him. And he was really in the casting sector of things more. But, uh, but we certainly crossed paths. New Orleans is not a very big town for, um, for glasses. So yeah, I, I certainly knew Jean. And uh, I miss New Orleans a lot. It was a really, really fun place to, to uh, live for a while. I was there from 99 to 2004. Great. And Mark is asking, as a young child, did you watch a lot of cartoons? Did, did cartoons inspire your work? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've still got, um, like, there's just little, little things about I think drawings too. Drawings in any way, whether moving or not, were, were a huge influence on me. You know, we, we, I, was, uh, I was very fortunate to have parents who read to me and we would have our favorite stories, you know, and, and always the illustrations were just as important as the story was. 
So right. I'm just holding these. I'm holding these for you guys so you can get a sense of scale. Yeah. Um, they're all, you know, they're all very, um, they're not feather weight pieces. These definitely have a really good solid weight to them. So there are, the other thing that we can do is put the images up on the screen. Absolutely. So, so yes, of course. And then maybe we'll just sh uh, show them and then people, if they have any questions, can see them right there. Yeah. And I've started to make this series as a, hopefully one day I want to do a Noah's Ark installation. It's kind of, it's one of those projects that's off in the distance for me a bit, but I'm practicing. And so these are like little muck cats for that. So this has this really like almost like baby giraffe face with those big eyes. These are very I was going to ask you what made you put the, the animals into the rowboats. Yeah, so yeah that's where, definitely, where that comes from. Definitely a statement on uh, global warming. You know, this that no, I don't think that's that's too hard to uh, kind of visualize, but um, but and just a sense of like where we're headed, <laughs> all of us, all of us together. And Claire, so, yeah. I'm. I'm going to put up uh, professional images of all the uh, okay. available pieces so people can see them with a little better lighting as well. Absolutely. And one of the things I wanted to say about my working process is that it is important to me to spend the time with the pieces in the studio when they're all cold to do the assemblage. Um, I'm not able to put these pieces together hot. And there's a couple different reasons for that. Um, I, when I say that, when I say putting them together hot, what that means is that um, they would actually be adhered to each other while they're in the glass blowing studio and being worked hot. Um, there are amazing sculptors who, who do some assemblage like that. Mm -hmm. In my case, a lot of this glass isn't even the same glass. So I wouldn't be able to put them together hot because this glass that the fox is made out of is that Italian glass that I was talking about. Mm -hmm this glass that's made the boat is made of is a totally different glass so they wouldn't actually fit together so it has uh, to cool totally before. yeah every, everything has to be done cold which mm -hmm. um is simultaneously great because it makes my life a little easier and it brings the risk of failure down a lot um mm -hmm. but it also makes my life really hard because i have to try to imagine how everything fits together while i'm working the glass to make sure that i can you know, like bend his little paws over in the right direction so that he's, you know, kind of gripping onto the side of the boat and looking off into the distance, you know, mm -hmm. looking for looking for land or what have you. It's very sweet. They're so sweet. Yeah. I like the idea that you live with them for a while and um, you have some sense of their personalities because yeah. you must see different personalities in the fox and the elephants. They look totally different when they're hot than they do when they're cold. It's uh -huh. really, it's really funny how the glass, you take it out of the oven when it's finally cold mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, this, this looks completely different than how I remembered it. It's just something, something to do with the movement. And also when things are hot, they, because they are literally radiating heat, they seem bigger and the colors look different. So when you do get them cold, it's a much different um, personality and way of, own way of viewing. And uh, another, th another thing about the way I work is that I really like to mitigate any kind of failure uh, because so much goes into all this and because glass blowing is such a, you know, it's, it's a very high energy craft. We use a lot of electricity. We use a lot of gas. Everything is, it's, it's got a lot that goes into it, including human energy and time and everything that goes into it. So I really do a lot of work to make sure that the pieces aren't going to be failures on the pipe when they're in the glass blowing studio. And doing the assemblage later on is a big part of that as well. It's probably the main reason that I started doing it that way is to make sure that I was having success in the, in the studio. It takes so much of the stress and just it just makes life a lot nicer. You can have so much more fun when you're not, you know, stressed by it. The holding your breath that the that the work is going to end up smashed on the ground. And I think there was a time in glass making when 
really working hard towards, um, you know, pushing it to the nth degree on the glass mountain pipe was a thing. But I think in this new world of energy conservation and being really thoughtful about how we approach our work, I've, I've completely let any conceptions of how glass needs to be made go. That, those are behind me. I work to make the work that I want to make and not because glass rules exist or there's some kind of um, chauvinism about the materiality of things. And so that's why I'm really, like, like I was saying about working with Toots, I think she taught me to say, this is the work I want to make and I'm going to figure out how to make it and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I've been really, I mean, it makes me so happy when I'm in the glass, when I'm in the cold working studio doing the finish work on these and when I'm in the hot shop making these little animals is like, that's when I really go into the zone, when time just falls away and other things just fall away. That's wonderful. I was yeah. going to ask you what influence um, Toots had on your career. Like, how oh. do you think things were different or changed spending that time with Toots and having her influence? You know, she, she's, she probably offered many times to... I don't know, maybe she said like, oh, do you want me to, you know, reach out to a gallery or, or um, do this or that for you? And I'd say, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll do that. But, but then I'd never take her up on it. But there were other ways that she was, uh, was indispensable as far as um, being a reference, being a, you know, a letter of recommendation or a reference. Those are, if you're talking literally about how she influenced my career, those would be very literal. But I think that her influence on me is way more nuanced than that. She just had this way of being about her that I just watched as an artist and said, that's what I need to learn to do. And I just studied her and, mm -hmm. and she, was, she was a mentor. I mean, maybe I wasn't exactly an apprentice, because I'm not making work like Tootsie's and probably would be surprised if I ever did. But I know that she just was very, she, she absolutely gave me the option of, of never having to say no to something where she said, I never want you to say no to something because, oh, I have to go to work um, next week or, or next month. She'd say, say yes to opportunities and we'll figure it out from there. And she actually really let me do that. Um, I left for two months to teach at Plant, uh, Penland in 2016, you know, and she didn't have me as an assistant for those two months, which were, you know, she had work to do. She couldn't mm -hmm. just afford to not have an assistant around, but she, she said, we'll figure it out. It'll be fine. We'll figure it out. And the same with the residency at Corning and other residencies that I've done. She just gave me the freedom and the time to do that. And, uh, and so, you know, as a, as a mentor and as an employer and as a, just a fixture in, in the glass world, she, she, changed everything about how I approach my uh, my creative life. She must take great um, joy in your successes as well, I'm sure, or great pleasures in seeing. She certainly has mm -hmm. been, she has certainly said so and been very uh, just joyous and gracious about mm -hmm. everything. When I told her I was starting to do the beadwork, she was like, she was like, oh my god, that's cool. She, you know, we do both love uh, Joyce Scott, and she's like, oh, that's fabulous. Yes, I can see that fitting into your work so well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so she's, yeah, yeah, she's, uh, she's very, very enthusiastic and, you know, just always a great, always a great ear. I've gone to her for advice um, for different things, and, and she will give me a no-nonsense answer when I really need it, you know, when, I, when I'm at a break, you know, make or break point on something. Um, she'll She'll give it to me straight. So that's been really great to have to have in my arsenal of tools as well. I'm going to show you guys the beaded snake. So I think I think I think quarantine has also taught me that I need to have a creative outlet that's not just the glass blowing studio. Because you know we don't know when this is going to be done, if ever, and then we don't know when it'll happen again. Mm -hmm. So I certainly, you know, I'm keeping that very much in mind, although now I'm here in Corning, I, I know that I have a glass studio I can go to whenever I need to. But at the same time, I think it's really important for me to keep my options open in terms of what I need for myself. And, uh, 
something to do when, when I can't be in the glass blowing studio. Now, Claire, Jonathan would like to know if you ever collaborate with other artists, and he thinks that you and Nancy Callan would be just a dynamite collaborative team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's actually a good, that's a good thought. I love Nancy, and I absolutely love her work. I wish I, wish I saw her more. Um, you know, she's so far away, and even when I'm out in the West Coast, it's usually for work, so it's not like we get to just hang out together. Um, but I've known Nancy since I was that first summer at Cornyn, uh, 1996. I've known her since then. And uh, I've just been watching her, her, you know, star rise with just amazement. She's, she's the best. So yeah, I, I absolutely could see that, especially like mixing her forms with my animals somehow. <laughs> yep. Yeah, she's a dynamite uh, artist in Glassboro. I really love her. And now, when you're creating the animals, do you work with a team or do you do those on your own? There's very little that I'm able to make on my very own. Um, I, I do have to have a team for the, for the animals. Um, they're, even though they're very small, for the most part, they are still in the glass blowing studio. Actually, I could come over here. Um, here's a couple. These are works in progress. So here's a couple little elephants who are... This is, the, this is the cup that would have created something like this. And so what I need is to have someone who's constantly taking this little guy, it's on a glass blowing pipe, usually on, you know, it starts on the nose, then we turn it around and we punty it up to the rear end here. And so I need my assistant to be constantly going to the glory hall and then bringing it out and then I can do stuff to it. So if I can have two hands free to do things to the, to, the, um, to the form and have a third, a second person who's basically the, the other set of hands to do all the heating and flashing of the piece. That's what I need to be able to make these. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Dan, do you have uh, other questions there? That was our last question. Oh. Okay. No. Yeah. Is there something that you'd like to cover that we haven't talked about, Claire? Oh, I've talked so much. I, I can't. Uh, you did great. I can't you were quite great, think. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. Yeah, no, this was just, this was a, such a pleasure. I think um, I'm so thrilled with this, you know, this body, how this work came out. And I'm just, I'm just ready to, to keep going and making more. I, um, you know, sometimes when I get into the glass blowing studio after being away for a while, it's really easy to get um, maybe a little bit nervous about pushing forms and, and really like making things um, bigger or a little crazier shapes. And so I'm looking forward to getting kind of my, my sea legs back now that I'm in Corning and I have access to the glass building studio on a more frequent basis and my, and my team um, to really getting into making more of the larger scale mosaics mm -hmm. and then seeing where we can go with the forms in a way that, that could be really um, exciting and interesting. So yeah, I just want to say thank you again. I'm so fortunate to be able to, to do this. I know that I'm very, very lucky and so fortunate in my friends and my collectors and my supporters and students, people have taken classes with me. All that is, it's um, immeasurable. And I really, really am very grateful. Well, we're very grateful, or I feel very grateful and delighted that I sell your work at the gallery. We're successful with it. And people come to the gallery, they really feel good about seeing what you're doing. And I look forward to seeing the boundaries that you're going to push within yeah. your work. It's going to be exciting. And I look forward to our border being open and you coming back to Toronto. You're so close Absolutely. now that you're in Corning. Very now I'm close. Closer. I yeah. know. I want to take. I want to take the boat over from Rochester. Wow! Wow! I think that would be so nice. I'll meet you. I'll meet you at the exactly. dock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. After our last boat ride in uh, Corning, not in Corning, in uh, Venice. Uh, I know. That was from Murano to Venice. That was a great trip. Yeah. Speaking of borders being open, let's hope that that um, starts to become something that that improves as uh, as the months go by here. And we all just stay safe and, mm -hmm. you know, continue to take COVID seriously. And hopefully we can 
see the end of it at some point. Well, all the best of luck in Corning. I know you're going to be a huge success. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm so, I'm so thrilled to be here. This, it's, it's really feels like home. It's really good. Right. Good. Well, thank you very, very much. And for everyone that's here with me, I know we all enjoyed your, our visit to your studio. It was wonderful. Thanks so much. And thanks for everybody's time. Take, okay. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks. You too, Claire. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.